And when you're ready to make a choice to know me and see me from within, then we can do that together because love is a choice, you know? And yeah, you will find those individuals and that chemistry, a hundred percent. It's a cho- We have the natural propensity to love, but you make that choice, you know? I know for example, I've had this experience that I've got family members that if I was not related to them, I would never look at them twice down the street, for sure. You know, we just, because of our relationship based on blood, we have that connection. But based on our natures, based on our mood, absolutely not. But I make that choice because of that relationship, you know? You, you, we have an autonomy of choice, you know? And so I even was saying it in my own journey, I'm not looking for someone who's gonna like sweep me off my feet or who's gonna like take my heart to different places. I'm looking for someone who wants to make that choice. I'm done with the love stories. I kind of want a life story. So make that choice and let's sit down and work on it. It's therapy we need, let's do it. It's, this is what you need and this is what I'm, I'm making this choice. Because when you love someone, you make these choices. You make choices out of that love. How are you? <laughs> really good. Yeah? Yeah, very happy to be here with you Thank today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we just did a little, um, just before rolling, we just did a little kind of mantra meditation, just like centre ourselves and mm. pause. And I definitely needed that, I think, today because one of the team, one of my team actually mentioned recently that every time I do one of these episodes, it kind of, the, the vibe of it is always given in some way by the guest that I have as Mm, well and so they're always slightly different because I kind of go with that vibe or I go into that in that path Mm -hmm. and um part of it was what we've just done where we've managed to like pause and center ourselves but also in my research like leading up to this um a bit about you one thing that you said that really stood out to me in an interview that you did was that um you just say it's okay to say I don't know Right. And that really stood out to me because I'm one of those people that if I think something's not going right or if it's, you know, not it's not perfect, I really am hard on myself and I think I should have known better, or I should mm. know this, or I should do it, have done it this way. So you've already helped me and we haven't <laughs> even started. So, Aww. yeah, I think that, that that was, like, really, um, yeah, profound for me, I think. And um, do you find that that's kind of the way you lead your life as well? Yeah, I mean, you know, you you often hear many people talk about like, what's your mantra? What mm-hmm. mantra are you living on? Or like, you know, what what are you, what mantra are you using to guide your life? Right. Um, the word mantra in Sanskrit comes from two words: manasa, which means the mind, and triate, which means to transcend or deliver. So when you have a mantra that, let's say, for example, I'll always be happy. Every day you wake up in the morning, you tell yourself, I'll always be happy. Um, even when unhappy situations manifest because you're stuck to that vibration of I'll always be happy, you have opportunity to see the positive in every experience that you have. Mm -hmm. So mantras are important and they kind of then allow us to be settled and, you know, there's so many things you don't know in this world, right? And you can go either way. You can either go, um, I don't know, so I need to know and, you know, I'm such a bad person because I don't know or I don't know and I need to know. Let me open myself to finding out. Mm -hmm. And it's the same kind of anxiety in the beginning, but it gets resolved differently by situating yourself in that way. So, yeah, yeah, anxiety anxiety is the right word because we live in a world where we feel we should (gasps) know everything. But how can one person possibly know everything? Exactly. It's that way we're living (laughs) with social media and all the kind of like influx of of this information that we get daily that we think that we should take every everything on board and we should know everything yeah it, yeah so much pressure yeah, I always say we're in an anxiety-filled society. It's with everything. You've got a beautiful house. It might burn down. So out of the anxiety of it possibly burning down, get insurance. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, you've just raised a beautiful child. They might become an idiot, so take them to the best school. You know, and there's your all your actions are based on a particular anxiety that is breeding if that situation doesn't manifest. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the likelihood of your house burning down is not so huge. Mm-hmm. But you still, out of that anxiety, bond yourself to 
securing yourself in that sense, you know, for the rest of your life, mm-hmm. even if that's not ever going to happen. So it's like anxiety is really the driving force of how the society is running and breaking out of that can be really difficult because yeah, so everyone's working with that. What's the antidote to that then, would you say? I mean, you've mentioned like rituals and mantra, but rituals is quite a good one and yeah. it's something I struggle with because I'm not very good at keeping, I know what's good for me intellectually, mm. but doing the thing consistently, I often like just, I do it for a bit and then maybe I, I stop. Fade away a bit. Yeah, yeah. fade away. <laughs> so I guess rituals is, is one of them. But yeah. yeah, what would you say are the like antidotes to that? You know, even like spaces like this where these mm. kind of conversations yeah. are being had. Talking. Um, yeah, and discussing <laughs> about it. In um, the scriptures, they talk about um, this beautiful verse. It says, Nasta praishu, abadreshu, nityam bhagavata sevaya. Constantly discussing um, higher wisdom so does this subtle thing to the psyche. Yeah, um, and it makes people just then probe to value a much more internal life. Um, you know, because we don't think about it. That's why naturally it will fade. It will fade over and over. And maybe um, a spiritual practice or a meditative practice is something that we're going for maybe once a week or twice a month, you know. So the more we engage with it, the more the value of it manifests within our being. And if there's value in it, then you'll do it. We do things that we put value in. Mm -hmm. If there's no value in it, you won't really put much effort into it. So these kind of conversations help to increase our value of internal well-being of, you know, um, going through your inner space. You know, as my mentor normally says, we've conquered the outer space, but the inner space we haven't, you know. Mm-hmm. We've got all these, you know, filled up buildings, but our heart is empty, you know. So taking that time to yourself um, and having these conversations that are a little bit more inward will mm-hmm. really help over time. 100%. Yeah. yeah, we definitely don't go inwards enough. Right. Um, and this conversation is a great like continuation to an episode I did with your mentor, Keshava Swami. Yeah. So this is like a great continuation to that so we can learn a bit more nice. um, about you and how he impacted you as well. But also, I know that you... So in the episode with him, he mentioned that being a monk doesn't have to be a, you know, a lifelong vow necessarily. Right. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and he mentioned that you can kind of you know, temporarily take this moment of time to, to be a monk or live a, in a monastic way. Yeah. Um, and you did that. Yeah, so, exactly. So yeah. how was that journey for you? It was interesting because um, I just graduated uni um, at University of Kent. I was doing a bachelor's in marketing. And um, my mom had just, you know, she'd worked, my mom works really hard. And so as an international student, it wasn't cheap to, to bring, you know, an international mm-hmm. student to the country. They It's a hectic price so in her mind she was thinking okay um he's gone to school let him come out and then uh start earning a living and maybe even be able to you know not reimburse me (laughs) but be able to you know like take care of us also Mm -hmm. it's like usually the duty of the children to maintain the parents um in the culture where i come from and so i was speaking with keisha swami right before and i felt you know i think a much more internal journey is what i need and i was you know, you know when you approach something in the beginning, you get super enthusiastic. It's kind of like a New Year's resolution. Like <laughs> you're like, I'll go to the gym every day. And then for the first month, you're it's there ready. every day, and then <laughs> gradually starts going down. So I had that enthusiasm, and I was like, Keisha Marge, I I wanna you know move in and just give my life fully like you have because he was in the monastery at that time for like 20 years and then he looked at me and said, you know, no rush. You know, give it a year. After a year, see how you feel, and then you can reassess yourself. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just an opportunity for learning. Um, You could say the monastic space is kind of like school where you're learning to conquer your inner space um, and you're, you know, um, restricting all other external factors that uh, make it harder for you to focus inward. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you I had to shave up my hair and all these different things so that I don't think too much about my externals, which then after I moved out, I started focusing on again. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so that I could focus on that inner person who's the Ian that sat within, that's viewing this world through the lens of this body, you know? And uh, yeah, and then one year turns to three, just like that. Uh, so yeah, there's no... There's this assumption that, oh, you have to fully give up everything. I know people who, you know, working nine to five jobs and then took out like a month or even a week to come and experience um, this 
way of living, grasp the principles and then see how they can marry those principles mm-hmm. with their life because you still have the reality to go to and the world is still, the matrix is still moving. So, you know, you can say, oh, give it all up. But then when rent is due, when, you know, the family and the kids need things that you have to provide, when you need things that you have to provide, you have to marry the two. So um, you learn the principles and you see how you can relate them in everyday life. And yeah, I think after the three years, I also thought maybe um, some people might find it even difficult to move to a monastic space. So let me come and give them some of the things that I learned so they don't have to. Yeah, <laughs> like that's, that. that's exactly what it's for. I think yeah. what you said as well, it just it, it triggers something in me because I think a lot of people desire that um, kind of ability to move into a space where you can just focus on right. you mm. um, and obviously like you said that you know we've got our lives we've got different responsibilities but if you have the ability to just move into a space for like however many months or years yeah. to focus inwards yeah. and like yeah the distractions are gone and then really that lets the wisdom like just flow, flow in. in yeah and is that how you felt a hundred percent you know and people try to do that like guys go on holidays right it's like oh let me take like a couple of weeks and go on a yeah. holiday but then you come back from the holiday less refreshed than you were when you left if anything you come you're coming back to the same anxieties Mm. amplified more because you are a way to deal with it all Mm. you know um so i think this is the right kind of holiday Mm. where you take that break to fully assess yourself understand yourself Mm. in a much more cohesive way you know um there's this psychologist maslow and he talks about the hierarchy of needs and he basically creates this gradation of things that need to be focused on. The, the basic being like your, your basic needs, like your food, clothing and shelter. And then he elevates to elements of belonging and relationship. And at the pinnacle, he puts self-actualization or self-realization in the sense that that's the last thing you think about. Mm. But then the spiritual journey kind of challenges you to flip that around. Because picture this, if you are self-aware, then you'll know what kind of relationships you need. You'll know what propensities you have based on your personality. So you angle yourself into the right kind of occupation or, you know, life path. And then it will be easy for you to maintain yourself because you know how to do it because you know yourself better, you know. So, um, yeah, this kind of a holiday uh, in one sense allows you to fully have that awareness. And that was it for me. Like I had this, you know, I was in the acting industry before. And so you're always on an external show and the internal person is not really being focused on Mm. or being um, experienced clearly. And I think from when I was like around 12, I wrote this poem at 12 years old and it was, how do I look when you see my face? I may smile as you speak. I may rejoice as you reach your peak, but I'm sad, you know? Um, And because I wasn't really focused on that emotion of my Mm. feelings, I'm just experiencing sadness, even though externally I'm showing all these, you know, like smiles or, you know, you know, you're going for like all these red carpets or events Mm. and you're having to create this external Mm. persona. Um, But yeah, the inner person is burning. So you knew then, even at that age, that it was all kind of surface. Something just wasn't working, you know, I mean, that that whole story is, it's an interesting one, but yeah, it just, it wasn't working. I mean, I chose to go into that reality in one sense to run away from my reality Mm -hmm. thinking that oh um i'll be happier that i don't have to really deal with ian's Mm -hmm. experiences and i can jump into any of these characters and be them Mm -hmm. and then yes you're getting that external reciprocation from the public you know they attach you to the role so even if you're playing a bad guy they look (laughs) at you like you're a bad person (laughs) you know um but then i'd always go back into my room back into my space and I am not settled. I am not situated. The show went well. The performances went well, but I'm still not happy within myself. And that feeling, yeah, was stemming from when I was really young, Mm. but I just didn't have an answer to it. But some or other serendipitously, Mm. spiritual wisdom kind of came into my life. Mm. And then I got to understand that I need to focus on that inner person so that the outer person can be more effective and transformative. Yeah, so there was a bit of a disconnect there when you were going back home after doing something. And then there was that, yeah, you needed to kind of focus inwards a bit more to connect with what you were doing externally. That's it. And I think it's funny how when you said you wrote that poem at 12, and like sometimes I go back and I read what I wrote around that age, Mm. and I'm like, wow, like that's profound. And you just, we underestimate, how our minds worked even at a young age I think yeah I think even better than like maybe adulthood because we were just closer to that kind of 
pureness, I guess. Yes, that's we're the thing. We're more yeah. like in tune. We're with, less intoxicated yeah. by the, the, you know, the harsh realities mm. of this matrix that we're in. You yeah. know, the the child is so vulnerable in one sense, but so open and enthusiastic mm. and excited. You know, excited for life, excited to play, excited to experience. Yeah. But then over time, once you experience this world, then you start, you know, even thanks to the media, you you get access to different things that are going on. Your enthusiasm burns, mm. and it kind of gets lost because mm. you're like wow this is what life really is like you know i just i recently then got my first job after i moved out the monastery and you know this work politics so i that was my first time experiencing work politics to that fashion you know where people are talking about each other or something's happening and you're hearing a different story here there and everywhere so i called my mom and i was like hey mom i i don't know how people do this because uh it's, this is insane like in the monastery you wouldn't have politics in the same fashion and um she told me welcome to the realities of this world. <laughs> and I'm like, "Really? You did this all your life?" She's like, "Yeah, we've had to deal with this from the beginning." And I was like, "Okay, then I'm not going to put myself in this th- in this kind of a world. I need to create a world where I'm out of these, you know, very defeating um enthusiasm killing environments mm-hmm. and situations, you know, and yeah. Yeah, cuz you so you say like you get to that point of where you go into the monastery mm-hmm. and so you know you're maybe struggling at a certain age and then the path led you to the monastery and it's like a reset then for you as an adult you're like resetting like what do I want looking inwards yeah. but then you're going back out of it into the world and then it's probably quite hard to then disconnect from the way of living in a monastery or like living that monastic life because mm. you just know how good it is when you're just focusing on on you and like what the essential like goal is of life is to connect with people and to like share compassion and wisdom yeah. so yeah going out of that must be quite difficult so what actually led you so let's talk a little bit about your backstory i guess right, okay. so what led you to be wanting to like you know join the monastery join the monastery yeah. right so it dates back to around 2017 i just come from my i just finished my first year of university um and over the summer um would go back home and spend time with the family mm-hmm. um you know for the three months and then you come back and carry on with your studies mm-hmm. for the second year and so i'd flown back home um i had all these plans to do shows appearances and different activities you know with the summer and um you know my family wanted me to stay home but i'm like no 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 i've got stuff to do you know and i hang out with my friends so i made new friends etc yeah this is, so yeah, so is in kenya where yeah. you were acting and had like a kind of active career yeah so my entire kenya. life actually lived in kenya so yeah. from when i was born till when i was around 18, 19, mm-hmm. I lived in Kenya, did all my experiences there. I was acting and engaged in the entertainment industry there. And then I came to study um, in 2016 um, in the UK. And then now went back now for the summer. And when I was at the summer, uh, when I was back home for the summer and I was, you know, trying to enjoy myself, my mom sits me down and tells me, oh, Ian, I need to tell you something. I went to hospital and um, they did a body scan on me and they saw that I've got cancer. And um, she was doing chemo and she didn't even tell me. But um, her cancer had rapidly moved from stage one to stage four um, because she had a hormonal-based cancer. So mm-hmm. the, the chemotherapy she was doing was high, uh, was exacerbating the cancer growth. Right. And so it had moved from her breasts to her lungs. And um, I'm a mama's boy. I was mm-hmm. only raised by my mom. Mm-hmm. And so I had this attachment. And um, the first thing that, you know, came into my mind was, oh, she's going to die. That's the first thing you of think course, about. Yeah. You watch it in news and you hear mm-hmm. other people going through these things, but you never think, oh, it's going to happen to you. No, you go straight to the negative. Exactly. Yeah. So in that stage, I was just so depressed. I canceled most of my gigs and just... I I went into drugs, actually, like, you know, I used to do a little bit of weed here and there, you know, (laughs) kind of get the vibe going. But this time I needed more to numb myself. And so I was doing other hard drugs, just trying to, like, run away from the pain that Ian is feeling from the potentiality of losing mommy. Mm. But in that, in me diving into that space, and that's why I know that these experiences can be bittersweet, is that I inquired from a much more authentic place with God. And I was like... You know, I was born and raised Catholic and I was like, okay, I have an awareness that there's a higher being or higher energy out there, but I'm not really understanding how this higher being is being represented because everyone's representing this higher being from their own subjective purview based on time, place, circumstance from society, etc. But I had this inquisition like, God, if you truly exist, then you tell me what you're about. 
Why are bad things happening to good people? Why is the world the way it is? Are we just born to live, get old and die? My mom's the nicest lady. She takes care of so many different people. Mm-hmm. Why does she, why is she the one who has mm-hmm. to get cancer? Mm-hmm. You know, why not even me? You know, at times you think like this. Um, and because I think of the sincerity of my inquisitiveness or, or my inquisition at the time, then I got opened up to these teachings. And randomly, a friend of mine, she was my neighbor, um, her name is now Sita Devi, but she was known as Stephanie before. She just posted a picture of this lady um, who I've now got to know. Her name is Mother Yamuna. And um, she was a practitioner of Bhakti Yoga, which is a yoga I practice. You know, and she had this mark on her face and a smile that was really genuine. You know, not a fabricated smile. You know, and I could kind of sense it as an actor, you know. You can know when someone's faking it. You know, it takes one to know one. Um, and I was just like... You know, I want to know how to be Zen like she is, you know, because there's a genuine sense of happiness within her. And so I messaged her and I asked her this question and she told me, um, I can't give you Zen, but I can give you the absolute truth. And first you need to know that you're not this body, but this spiritual soul within. And then that evening, my mom came home from chemo, you know, and she had really, her head was shaved and, you know, chemo really exhausts your body. But she still had the energy to smile, be positive, to pray and, you know, create a good energy for all of us at home. So my question was, okay, who's making this um, joy? Where is this joy coming from? Because it's not coming from that body. It must be something more within. So maybe this spiritual thing makes more sense. And then I was like, okay, I want to find out more. So she invited me to the temple. We have a temple similar to the monastery that I lived in in the UK. Mm -hmm. There's one there in Nairobi. And so I went there and I hit them with all these questions and all these monks are looking at me and they're smiling, you know, and they're really like, they're, they're, they're blissed out that I'm asking all these devastating, um, you know, hard hit questions. And then they just open for me scriptures like the Bhagavad Gita and start showing me these different verses where the divine energy is speaking about the world and about ourselves and the journey that we have to go through. And I was like, wow, there's literatures that explain this in detail. Um, and they're like, yeah. And I asked them, okay, so if I take to these teachings based on what you've showed me and um, I inquire about my mom's welfare, will it work? And they said, yes. And so I was like, give me everything. <laughs> so they gave me everything. Um, I went back home and I was even telling my mom about it. The mom, I went to this temple. It's so cool. Um, and she's like, oh, are these Hare Krishna guys, are they the ones you're talking about? I see them, you know, walking down the street. They don't have jobs. They're just wearing bed sheets, you know. Really, these are the people you're hanging out with. I'm not paying all that money for you to get an education to run around in bed sheets. Singing and dancing. Yeah, and, but I was just getting into it. I was like, yeah. And then she was like, okay, I think you should stop. But... I just got such amazing wisdom. Why should I stop? Mm-hmm. So she knew that, oh, in order for, for him to not go, I'll cut off his funding, you know, because um, I was still under her shelter and I couldn't really move around with public means that, um, you know, efficiently because of my status as an actor. So then I used to have to lie to her that, mom, I need some money to go to the club. <laughs> Um, well, it wasn't a real lie. I still went to the club, <laughs> but I didn't use my money. I'd use my friend's money. And then um, I'd use the money that she gave me as transport to go to the temple to and fro and learn a little bit more about these teachings in depth. And I met some of the monks there and they told me, um, hey, we know you because you're a public figure, of course, but uh, we want to let you know that this is... Um, the best thing you could do with your life is turning towards a spiritual cause because you're a spiritual being. We all are spiritual beings having a human experience. And so you need to feed that spiritual identity and then you can go out there and transform the world. And so I got into it and they gave me all these books this one evening and I come home and I see all the cars in the driveway. So I was like, oh, mom's home. So I'll just put them under my sweater, (laughs) rush in and go into my bedroom and then she won't find out. But as soon as I open the door, mom's standing right in front of me and she's asking me where did you come from and I was like oh I was just at my friend's Billy's and she's like no but Billy came asking for you so I was like oh crap (laughs) and then she's like but you know you're smelling of incense you're smelling of some curry because you know you yeah are you sure you must have been at the temple isn't it and I was like yeah yeah I'm sorry and rushed in and she got so upset and she was like I'm booking you the next flight to go back to London go back to the UK and there you won't deal with these high Krishna spiritualists you know you can focus on the priorities but, but then did she know. <laughs> exactly I came back and just found them everywhere yeah. and realized that there's so many people living their life with this wisdom mm. 
And I was just like, I'll get into it more. So as I was studying, I would simultaneously go for these spiritual programs, which would host in different places and just learn more and ask questions. And I was enticed by the enthusiasm and the bliss that these monks had in their lives, especially Keshav Swami. Mm. Um, when I spent time with him and I could just, you know, he's like a 40 year old man, or I think 30 something at the time, late thirties. And, you know, he's very in touch with his emotions, happy, situated, you know, not disturbed or forced to have an ego and identify with like an element of manhood, mm. but just being sat within himself. And I was just so attracted and I was like, I think I want to experience experience this um and yeah then he just told me yeah come and give it a shot experience some time in the monastery so I went actually in my third year for, um in the summer break instead of me going back home I said I'm gonna stay and live in the monastery so I did um, a couple months there which was supposed to be one month then turned to like three months and then um when I came back and to finish my third year I had this resolve that yeah maybe I should move in and then Meru Keshav saw me and the rest is history. This is history. <laughs> so what would what do the teachings say about faith because you mentioned that you were raised like a Catholic so I know religion spirituality and science like it's very sometimes it's a bit of a hard mix of things mm. all together in one yeah. so um yeah it's kind of good to try and um unpick a lot of that stuff but faith like right. do you would you say that you have this as your faith or what what would you describe as faith well that's a very good question i mean you can look at faith from all different angles you know you've got faith that uh your house is the way it is when you left it in the morning mm. you know there's an element of faith that's required you know um you've got faith that uh you know, after this, you're going to do X, Y, and Z because you've planned for it. So you have faith in its, in its manifestation. You know, there's certain things that you believe in um, that are true to you as an individual. So, you know, you can broaden faith in that element. But if it comes maybe in the purview of like a higher personality or a higher being, yes, um, you know, from a scientific perspective also, you know, we have awareness that there's an intelligence beyond just our intelligence. I mean, we've made tables, um, you know, cars, buildings, but there's there must be an intelligence that's created this symbiotic relationship between plants, animals and humans. There must be this an intelligence that's, you know, allowing for the sun to rise and, you know, set every day and the moonlight to come simultaneously and, you know, all these nature filled experiences, you know, there must be an intelligence there. Mm -hmm. Now, whether we identify this intelligence as a person or as an energy or in or, you know, as a higher power, or higher light mm -hmm. is subjective, but we're referring to the same um higher intelligence from multiverse ways and just like with ourselves you have a relationship with me as a friend or you know as an acquaintance you have a relationship with your relatives in a much more intimate way you're the same person with different relationships similarly this high intelligence can have different ways to relate to it mm -hmm. based on one's intelligence and openness yeah. for it yeah i think this might be controversial but mm -hmm. with with religion whenever there's religion involved it's quite a difficult subject to talk right. about and but i think that ultimately a lot of them are saying the same kind of thing it's literally what you're just saying yeah and to have faith in something is almost like to surrender to something yeah. because you you just have that faith that it's going to work out for you and I think you had that almost when you were asking that question maybe it, yeah it was a question but you kind of were giving yourself over to like I'm surrendering to I want a sign and I want to know like what like, the answer is but that I'm letting it. you tell me what that yeah. is and then it kind of flowed you into this amazing path um and even now like you're okay you may be out of the monastery at the moment but you're still involved definitely in that kind of um you know with the with the monks and everything but you're also doing what you kind of originally were doing where you're definitely in the limelight a bit more like you're doing talks um you're you're you know doing interviews and you're you're out there still so it's like you're still kind of doing what mm. you initially set out to do yeah. but like in a different light exactly yeah, and yeah people because people think that you need to change everything about yeah. yourself in order to embrace a spiritual that's life that's obviously embedded in you in a certain yeah. way and that's obviously a passion of yours that's always going to be nature to yeah. you yeah yeah there's a there's a there's a um a nice term that's used in um 
Sanskrit known as Yukta Vairagya, which means engaging your propensities for higher purpose. So, um, you know, whether you're a gardener, whether you're a, whether maybe you like to make music, whether you like to perform, whatever it is that you've been gifted with in this lifetime, you can utilize it for higher consciousness. You know, you have an ability to communicate. And I know you, you're in the PR side of things, for example, <laughs> but now you're engaging your ability in creating conversations that create a much better atmosphere for the world, mm -hmm. you know? So people don't have to change themselves. They just have to change their consciousness mm -hmm. and then approach the same things that they're doing with the right mood and the right eye. And like channel that. it in a certain way. Yeah. 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 So um, I wanted to talk to you a bit more about um, when you said that you had certain struggles and you were kind of thinking, focusing more about the external rather than internal. Mm. Um, so with like escapism... Um, and coping mechanisms and things like that. It's not something I talk about much, but it, when I was younger, I definitely, you know, everyone has their story. Mm. But one of mine was like not talking. Like I was very, I was very quiet, but like uh, with family or even with, you know, in school, I was very, very quiet. I wasn't really talking. And it was definitely like a, um, a result of some kind of, you know, struggle and trauma that I was mm. going through and it was a coping mechanism. So this is why I think it's really important for me to put myself out of my comfort zone and do something that's all about Love talking. It. Love <laughs> it. Um, so like, that's why, it, I mean, it's obviously a challenge, but, you know, you have to push yourself. So what, um, for like young Ian, like what was it that you were trying to escape from and like how were you coping? What were your coping mechanisms? Right. So, yeah, acting for me was my main mm. coping mechanism. Um, uh, I was bullied quite a bit in my youth because I have an effeminate nature and my expression is quite feminine. And you can imagine my voice was way higher <laughs> when I was young. Um, and, you know, I loved dancing and the arts. And, you know, I remember I got a PlayStation when I was a kid, but I didn't really get the PlayStation for me. But I got it because I knew it would attract guys to come to the house and I can, I can make some friends. Mm -hmm. Because um, where I lived, guys were either playing football or, you know, rugby or something of the sort or wrestling, you know. And, you know, my... <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not fully equipped in that side of things. You know, so um, when, especially because of the bullying that would happen, um, I could say at the time um, there was a lot of misinformation about people of an effeminate being or, you know, of a different nature. And so there was a lot of bullying that would happen and it was quite severe to the point where I would, you know, dread going to school on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, things did change when I became an actor because now everyone wanted to be my friend. So mm -hmm. I realized people oh, are yeah. fake, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, be warned. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, acting was my way of running away from Ian's pain and being absorbed in that character that I was playing. So even I, I remember in some days I would perform a monologue and two, three days later, I'm still maintaining the accent, you know, I would do different kinds of um plays and different kinds of scripts and we would l try to learn different accents from different places and uh, my mom would be like wait are you performing this again this weekend and I'm like no 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 we finished it but why are you still trapped in the role you know you finished the role you're not performing it anymore why are you still doing it and that was my escape because I didn't want to deal with Ian mm -hmm. and what Ian was going through so let me get trapped and situated within this role, within this performance. And so, yeah, like you used silence and like that withdrawal mm -hmm. as a way to deal. For me, it was immersing myself into a different reality, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. that. So what advice would you give people that might be going through that now? Mm, um, it's normal. It's we, we, we naturally, we're forced as soon as from when a baby is born, you know, Everything is a coping mechanism, you know. The, from one of the scriptures, it says that um, the, the baby is crying and the mother is thinking that the baby is crying because the baby is hungry or sleepy. But the soul is crying out like, oh, no, no, I'm on this cycle again. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> you know? I'm, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, and then, <laughs> they, but there can't be any direct communication between the mother and the child in that way. So the child has to cope mm. and then realize, okay, when I cry, I get attention. When I quiet, I'm avoided. Mm. And then slowly, they, you know, so in life, you're dealing with different ways to cope with reality mm. um, my advice would be that you know meditation and a much more internal journey of spirituality um, and you know connecting with teachings like that of the Bhagavad Gita mm. can really help that that would be the best coping mechanism because you need to cope somehow mm. yeah. <laughs> especially with this economy mm. with this life that we're living you need to cope yeah. so um, yeah going through that internal journey is the best 
um, coping mechanism because then you sit with that person, you address those emotions, you communicate those emotions, if not to others, at least more effectively to yourself. Mm. I always say a good therapist is not one who you remember after you're done with the therapy. Mm. A good therapist is one who bounces back everything you've said for you to absorb it and resolve it and think, oh, I had the answers all along, mm. you know, because you're becoming more in touch with your own being. So an internal journey is that where you give yourself that kind of therapy and um, focus on yourself. So meditation, um, you know, discussing who the inner person is, who are we in our core and exploring teachings that help you understand that better is would be my, my advice because that's what definitely helped me and answered my questions. Yeah, I completely agree. We definitely need that space to look a bit more inwards and just sit with us. Mm -hmm. um, so with the where are you at now then with, in your journey with you mentioned masculinity and femininity. So where how do you feel in yourself right now? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, what do the teachings yeah. say about that? Yeah, I mean... I, I quote this book and I've quoted it before. It's, there's a book called The Nectar of Instruction, mm -hmm. which um, is a powerful book. If you haven't read it, I suggest I'll probably grab your copy. We'll link it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, there's a personality, his name is Rupa Goswami, and he's explaining the basic tools that we need to have a happy life. And the first instruction that he talks about is learning to sit within yourself and owning your domain and accepting what you've been given as a vessel and maneuvering it out of appreciation of it without comparing yourself with others because comparison is definitely the mm. thief of joy, um, you know. Uh, and yeah, it talks about controlling the tongue, the belly and the genitals, you know, and controlling these three things, having an, a mastery over these um, three elements, you know, what you say, what you internalize, what you consume, who you associate with, who you give yourself to in a vulnerable way. And um, the more I started taking to learning that principle of owning my domain, the more I've started to like myself and appreciate myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, like, this year, 2024, is uh, the year where I become someone that I like. Mm -hmm. Normally, we're trying to be someone that other people like and appreciate. 100%. But I said, yeah. no, 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 no. This year, I want to look at myself in the mirror and be like, Ian, yeah, I like this guy, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and you know, being happy and situated with myself, regardless of what my um, my body brings. Some, some days desires are different. Some days my dressing style is mm. different. But being open to experiencing that without fearing other people's opinions. Because I've actually noticed persons will put you down when they see that you're, you have a fear of them putting you down. Mm. They'll take advantage of that and then press it. But if you're owning your domain and you're happy and situated, or at least trying to learn to be happy and situated with what you've been given, then people will find it very hard to, to put you down. You know, it's like, what are you putting down? I like what I've got. Thank you very much. Yeah, the energy that they'll feel that will come off of you is that confident energy that you 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 know that you're comfortable in your body and with who you are. Exactly. And that's the most, as you said, that's the most important yes, thing. Yes, and it doesn't mean that like you don't have flaws or you don't have yeah. imperfections. You just have compassion you know? for those. Yeah, things. and you're like, you know what? Even with these, I'm good. Mm. Like I'm and I'm I'm situated. I'm happy with mm. it, and it makes it it makes things happen. It makes things work. You know. I, you know, just on a side note with that, you know, um, most of my friends are into cars and, you know, th one of my friends is in a car that he doesn't really like. And so he's always looking at all the other cars on the road. But I'm like, yo, if that car and you and your car has moved you from point A to point B, then it doesn't really matter the aesthetic of the car or how it looks or, you know, but you did its purpose and brought you from point A to point B. So similarly, this vessel might have some flaws, might have some things mm -hmm. that you'd want to perfect to improve, but it's still moving you around from point A to point B. And there's an, a power in having gratitude for the magic that is already present within you right now. Yeah. yeah and so I could say on my journey, it's, it's a work in progress. I'm, you know, I'm never claiming that I'm there, but I'm definitely in a much better place than I was like 10 years ago. I was just going to um, say, it's definitely a work in progress for all of us. Yeah. It's, always, it's ongoing work. It's not like a destination where you're just going to be like, now I'm perfect how I am. Because life will always throw you different challenges. You're going to come across problems. And yeah, it will probably change you every time as well. Because yeah. I've noticed every time you have some, you know, some challenge in life, there's a shift in you. In, in consciousness but just in the way that you are yeah so we're yeah we're ever evolving yeah exactly people. yeah you know it's it's an interesting one um 
I know one monk, he, he was trying to share this wisdom to, of spirituality to new people. And they asked him, this was in the hippie eras of the 60s, mm -hmm. what, did, what is this experience like? And he told them, it's like an ocean of LSD. And I don't know if you've experienced LSD before, no. but something interesting about those kind of um, hallucinogenics mm. is just when you think you've got control <laughs> and you're like, I've got it. You lose yourself even more. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it Maybe works kind of like that. Maybe have to go back to go forward. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, as soon as you think that you've reached a particular pinnacle, mm. you're thrusted down into yeah. like this world of oh no 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 that's no no. Life. You know, and that's life. You'll never there's there's no stage of really being of full control um, and surrendering to I'll never really be of full control, but I want to dance with this journey and enjoy the waves. Mm. I was like, then that makes so much sense. Ocean of LSD. I yeah, like that. I like that. Oh my god, I'm just. <laughs> imagining that now in my mind yeah hmm. <laughs> maybe it'll be something I try in the future Ooh, I don't know who knows <laughs> um, so that brings me on to like self-love mm -hmm. I think and we um we met once at a talk that you did um like a wisdom talk on mm -hmm. love um which I found extremely interesting really inspiring and I think so many people like to talk about love because this is what we want and then we can say that we just want success we want all of this and but ultimately like when we boil it down that is what people are interested in that's yes. what we want yeah i mean you can see that that's what sells as well like even externally on like tv or books or whatever and um, but aside from that like the real genuine love like self it starts with self-love and that's yeah. so i guess that's what we're following on from mm -hmm. but what i'd really like to dedicate um, a big portion of this like chat to is to tap into the wisdom that you've kind of accrued over these years and talk about love because I would really like to dedicate a lot of time to like that subject. I love that. Um, so <laughs> self-love, so you mentioned like kind of where you're at at the moment, but how, how have you, um, how is it evolving for you now? Like are you kind of, I know you're saying it's like an ongoing thing, mm -hmm. um, but uh, do you think that this is something we have to start with first before we can kind of accept it and receive it? Yeah, um, the, starting it and you, you starting it and, and having to wait. I don't think they they're necessarily mutually exclusive. Mm. I think it's stuff that can be done simultaneously. You can start going through your journey of self love, and simultaneously opening yourself up to opportunities where love manifests. From the purview of the Bhagavad Gita, which is like my my go to guide, mm -hmm. um, we're being probed and encouraged to love ourselves but who's the self that you're loving you know when you ask someone who are you they'll always mention either or oh, this is my name I'm this many years um you know uh I do this for a living I like to do these activities they mention um situations and circumstances and labels that can change your name can change. Your age is changing every day. Um, what you do for a living can change. So that doesn't really define you. So, you know, this is nice question that's, that's always asked. If I take away everything that's not you, who are you then? You know, who's that person? If I take away your, your name, I take away your occupation, mm -hmm. I take away your, the things that you like to do for fun, who's that person then who's remaining? And that person in the teachings is known as the, the soul, Atman, the being. And that being also, the soul, who's us, has an identity, has a form, has a, um, experiences, has a mood that um, in one sense, because of this material body, we lack access to, you know, we, or the access to it is quite limited because, uh, you know, we're focused on the demands of the body. So the body kind of acts as like your distraction. And so if you utilize in the body to tap into that person and that soul, the nature of this soul is that it's eternal. Uh, uh, in the teachings, it says it's eternal, full of knowledge and blissful. So then you, when you tap into that person more and more, you get, um, ac you get access to this inner bliss that is sat within yourself. That is actually your natural constitution. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember I said it on the talk and I can say it again, mm -hmm. is what's the common factor between us up the pop on the street, the billionaire in his mansion, or and everyone else all around the world, is that everyone is looking for happiness. They're all seeking that because it's our natural predisposition. We're seeking something that we have internally, that we just need to use this vessel of the body to access, you know? And so when you have that awareness that I am that spiritual being, then the Bhagavad Gita then probes you to 
tap into that spiritual being how through meditation and yoga the word yoga actually means to connect so connect with that being or with you, with that version of yourself that soul within and then the more you connect that in a bliss and in a knowing and in a eternality comes to manifest comes to fruition and almost kind of possesses your actual physical body you know it, it will possess you you will become always blissful um or even journeying towards blissfulness in every circumstance you'll be inquisitive to know more and not beat yourself up that you don't know but be opening to be open to knowing more um you know and yeah that bliss will really manifest so self love really starts from there according to these teachings mm-hmm. which i really appreciate that you're looking inward perceiving that in a person and from there then you start to heal a lot of things um it takes up these layers is a statement known as cheto darpana marjana it's there's this dust that's covering the mirror of our, of our being that um the world has really masked so the more we take to this meditative practices that person your inner being becomes more clear to you your traumas become more clear to you your pain becomes more clear to you and then you have a strong opportunity to forgive to accept to allow and to receive from that position mm-hmm. otherwise it becomes really hard mm-hmm. <laughs> you know so yeah that really tapping into that inner world and meditating and focusing on that inner being i encourage everyone to meditate every day mm-hmm. to sit with that inner space in that inner space for at least even 2 minutes and grow it up from there and um yeah you will experience that love and then it just you just want to give it to everyone mm-hmm. you know how do you meditate then so let's give people actual um like instructions on like how best not how best because right. it's obviously different for everyone mm-hmm. i guess but but an an idea a rough idea of what the yeah. best way to do what you've just said right so you know meditation from a broad sense could be something that you do in full absorption that stops the inhibitions of your mind taking over you know so for example some people maybe love to paint and when they're painting they just allow their hands to move through mm. the canvas and are not really consciously thinking this color that color this and that you know so that's one method of meditation doing something that you're absorbed in where the inhibitions of your mind kind of go because your mind's like a monkey you know it's always <laughs> bouncing even as we're having this conversation i'm sure your mind is still going yeah. okay what's this and then <laughs> this and then this and did i do this at home and this and that you know the mind is still always moving so meditation from a broad sense works in that way when we're coming more with this intention to tap into our inner space breathing exercises are really good so being able to observe the breath taking nice strong deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth and having these moments where you focus on the experience of your body taking in oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide that's one level which can also be good and bad can be not bad but can be difficult with dealing with the taxing mind that is giving so many things so what i enjoy doing and what i've seen really works is mantra meditation which is where the by vib- you release vibrations that then the mind can focus on because the mind needs to focus on something mm. be it a point be it a something it needs to focus on otherwise all these thoughts just travel and travel um so when you use mantras you know there could be different mantras om mantra is a very mm. powerful one that people regularly mm. use i've even seen a video of a of a baby who's crying intensely and the father places him on his chest and recites the om mantra and the baby immediately gets calm wow. because it's a centering vibration mm. you know and so when you recite this kind of mantras that vibration goes into your ears um gives the mind something to be engaged in and simultaneously goes into your heart and situates the soul the being within this mm-hmm. body and um the different mantras you can do i focus on the hari krishna mantra which is a beautiful mantra and i just love it and you can sing it you can rap it <laughs> you know you can do any you know you can recite this mantra in different ways as i was coming i had my headphones on and i was just like hari krishna <laughs> you know like that um yeah, and, change uh, it up to what works for you to what works mm-hmm. for you like that and just, but yeah so engaging that higher vibration within your mind gradually starts to purify so having mantra sounds regularly i'd say is really powerful for that yeah and you might not even realize it's 
working but you know because i think we're kind of delayed with what our body is doing so like, i think if you just continue doing it and it's like a more of a ritual and consistency mm. then your body will naturally after a while you'll think oh actually i do feel better i kind of need that yeah, yeah. You, you feel like yeah i definitely yeah. needed that and because we're in this society where everything is just always rushed mm. and you can get everything immediately or oh, you want this mm. amazon prime tomorrow it's at your house yeah. you know the patience of waiting for something to grow and manifest mm. is slowly and slowly going going away mm. but if you just trust it and i think also and having faith in that yeah. in what you're doing and what you're investing yourself in i think with patience as well ironically when you are definitely then sat well into patience things speed up mm. naturally i think that's actually what happens yeah so it's quite ironic because you're too focused on yeah. like the clock ticking you know mm. you've gone through the same minutes but every time you've gone through it, it you know it goes just as fast mm. but now because you're focused on it It, this every second is like really slow you know like when you're having a bad day at work yes. and you just can't <laughs> wait for the day to end those last 10 minutes feel like eternity yeah <laughs> right definitely. but if you're having a good time you still experience those same 10 minutes mm. but um they're blissful and it even you know you're having such a good time it's like oh i was supposed to leave work 10 minutes ago mm. oh jolly me yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. it, like it kind of goes with everything in life yeah. and like going back to love as well like having that patience because there are so many people out there that want these connections i mean connections with friends and relatives i guess that's different but like that romantic connection with someone there are so many people that are waiting for love or for that to come mm -hmm. but it's like yeah i think the waiting around it's like that energy with the waiting it's totally different to like just scam. having that patience it's a serious scam. so what, what do you advise people then <laughs> that are looking for love like mm -hmm. what do you advise them what do the teachings say well you know we've got desires um in one sense some of our desires become fructified some of our desires don't fructify some of our desires fructify in a way that we desire and some of them fructify in a way that we weren't even expecting and at times if your desire got fulfilled it would have been worse off mm -hmm. you know because also our desires change they're flimsy as well to some degree so i'd say um you know when you desire something let's say i was in this situation as well after moving out the monastery i'm looking for um a relationship and i was like trying everything going on hinge and mm. you know let me go for like a speed dating thing and you know with this strong desire because in one sense you need to put yourself out yeah. there right um but then i just realized now nah, um it's a scam because you're going there with these expectations and you're expecting other people to tick these expectations for you and they've also come with their manual which is expecting you to tick theirs and so it stops becoming that love that I'm looking for and then it becomes a transactional situation or oh, oh can you give me what I want and can I give you what you want can I compromise to give you what you want and you can do the same for me great relationship is that really what I want for the rest of my life? Mm. Just compromising? No. I want somewhere where I can serve and offer and give without even expecting to receive, without making it a transaction. And so um, my advice would be, or, or also not just my advice, but the advice of the teachings is um, calling out to this higher divine energy or that you trust where your shelter is and, you know, requesting that, you know, if it is in your desire, if it is in my remit, please give me someone that can give me this exchange and I know it will satisfy me on a psycho-emotional level. Mm. But I leave it up to you to decide because I'm not in control anyway. I can't decide. If it was for me to decide, then, you know, we would be married, you know, in the, in the house by the hills. Mm -hmm. But all these things are not under our control, you know. So opening ourselves up to expressing that this is my need and being open to expressing that that's your need and then allowing the universe to dance you to bring you to that need. You know, um, so for those people that are, find it difficult to kind of identify what true love really is, and we always we're always trying to define right. what that is, aren't we? Can you give a go at like trying to define what true love is? Right. Oh wow. Um, <laughs> as soon as you said that, I was thinking of this verse. Um, I don't remember the verse fully, but there's these two terms: ahaituki apratihata which basically mean unmotivated and without a, a desire for anything for yourself, you know? So like, and the teachings explain that the closest relationship for this kind of love is one between a mother and a child, where, um, you know, the mother is giving to this child, this child, like for the first five, six years, 
actually no, for the first 18 years, <laughs> it's nothing but just a widespread plethora, plethora of desires. I need food, I need affection, I need sleep, I need all these things. And I'm not going to give anything to you, mommy, you know, and um, the mother is just giving. Is just giving, is giving that protection, is giving, not expecting any transaction from the child. And then when those spontaneous moments of the child saying, I love you, mommy, come, then the mother is so grateful, you know, and it's like, that's why I do it. I, I mean, that's not why I do it, but I'm, even if you didn't tell me that you love me, I'll do it anyway. You know, it's unmotivated. There's no direct motivation. Mm -hmm. And there's not one where you're expecting a transactional exchange, like, oh, give me this and I give you that, you know? Um, and so th that, that kind of love is the closest we can perceive to this pure kind of love that we all have the capacity to have, where we can just give without thinking or filling our own cup, mm -hmm. you know, um, fully unmotivated and not having that desire for, oh, I want something for myself. Can you give me something? And I noticed it actually when I go into a relationship and things didn't work out and I was devastated in the beginning, but I still felt that I have so much affection for this person and I, you know, there was no malice, no hate, although the chapter ended in a way that I did not want. Um, I never felt like something was robbed of me. If anything, I felt way much better. And I even reached out to them and I was like, yo, you know what? Like, I'm so grateful for the experience we've had, mm -hmm. you know? And I don't feel, even though you, you hurt my feelings mm -hmm. in that moment of time, you know, my love and affection for you hasn't changed. I don't regret anything that I've done for you or, you know, I don't wish that I never did it, you know, like, um, I'm, you know, there was, there's no motivation. I wasn't expecting anything from you. I gave it with my full heart. And when you do that, you, you never suffer in that way. So that's how I would, you know, yeah. describe it's that unmotivated. Yeah. Do, but I think it's an important thing for everyone to try and achieve because like you said, when you're just giving out kindness and love, then that's kind of what's just coming back, and you, you're right. not you're not suffering because you you hope, you know you have a clear conscience, but also you just you're just in that bubble of, of exactly. Love. And yeah. you know what? I think one good and I've just thought about it right now. It just came <laughs> into my mind spontaneously. But one good activity that would be nice for everyone to add into their lives mm -hmm. is in any moment of your day or even any moment of your week, have at least one activity that you do that you do not receive direct mm -hmm. benefit of, you know, mm. be it if it's going to like a food bank and you're serving others, mm. you know, um, and you're, no one's, you know, looking at you and saying, oh, you're such a great person for doing this. Something where you do not get the credit, I think is a nice thing to practice for us to get into this mood, isn't it? Um, you know, and that's a challenge. I'll give you that challenge. Yeah. I'll take that challenge yeah, myself as well. Yeah. You know, what what things can I do where I'm not receiving the benefit? You know, am I going to donate to a charity and not say that I've donated, you know, and not how, and or, you know, or donate as someone anonymous, you know, or, you know, will I do um, a project for someone and help someone out and not attach myself to the status of I'm the person who's done this, you know, and maybe that could be a good activity for everyone who's even listening and you to um, try, you know. Yeah, it's an opportunity to be proud of yourself, not mm -hmm. always wanting that external validation, but just actually yeah, sit with yourself that and I've feel done something proud. good, yeah. yes, you know, yeah, so 100%. yeah, do that food bank or, Let's you know, it. go and, you know, exactly. <laughs> I'm definitely going to do that. Do together. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so with love, just to kind of end on that kind of subject, mm -hmm. um, where does chemistry fit into all of this? We always talk about chemistry and attraction, and then there's a fine line between lust and love, and sometimes right. you don't know which one it is. You know, is it real or is it just am I feeling this? Do I need this kind of validation right now because I'm missing that from my childhood or this or that? Right. So what do you, what do you have to say about the chemistry side of things? Mm, um, yeah, that's a good question. It's well, not an easy one, girl. sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, because yeah. we need to know. <laughs> so, you know, there's... So the same personality I mentioned, Rupa Goswami, yeah. he says that um, you can experience love with anyone and everyone, but you will need specific types of individuals. Mm. These individuals have these three categories. Swajatiya, which means like-mindedness. Snigdasya, which means there's a form of affection that, that is present there. And Ashraya, that they can give you some advice or guidance or, you know, their perspective is one that you can resonate with because they understand you. Mm. So, you know, there's eight 
billion people in this planet we're, we're say, not expecting everyone to vibe on our frequency 100 percent. Mm. but over time you will notice individuals that you're like-minded you know you speak to someone and you feel like no 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 they get my point you know or you're with a group of friends and you know yeah and you know you crack a joke and there's that one guy who's laughing because <laughs> he he gets it and then for the rest you have to kind of explain your joke so then you find oh no no there's a like-mindedness here and then when you find individuals that there's an element of like-mindedness with you know like either you're doing similar activities together be it like you know maybe you perform music together you like going for gigs together you like you know doing something charitable together then um in your exchanges you sense an element of affection and the nice thing about this is that uh it's not one where you know in in our modern day life people are like courting and stuff so mm-hmm. you hide your expression of your affection um and so the other person doesn't really know what they're dealing with mm-hmm. and so you know someone's you know, you, you, you're you attracted to a person and you're communicating your attraction to them and they'll act nonchalant, like they don't really care, even though they do. And then when you leave them, they're like, oh no, but I actually felt like this for you, but you know, but you didn't tell me. So I'd say, you know, being open to expressing that this is where I'm at. And um, if someone is ready to, you know, step up to that plate, then fine and then it saves you so much time as well Mm -hmm. you know rather than having to bounce through all those courting stages and trying and failing I think if you're open about it from the beginning I even said next time someone comes to give me small talk I'll give them a link to a google talk and I mean a google doc and there you'll find my favorite color that you know the (laughs) yeah exactly yeah yeah yeah, exactly here you go you can just scan this (laughs) and you'll get all of that then when you're ready to make a choice to know Mm -hmm. me Mm -hmm. and see me from within yeah then we can do that together yeah. because love is a choice, yeah. you know, and yeah, you will find those individuals and that chemistry. So you think love is a choice? A hundred percent. It's a cho- We have the natural propensity to love, but you make that choice. You know, mm. I know for example, I've had this experience that I've got family members mm. that if I was not related to them, I would never look at them twice down the street for sure. You know, it, we just because of our relationship based on blood, we have that connection. Mm. But based on our natures, based on our mood, absolutely not. Mm. But I make that choice mm. because of that relationship, you know. You, you can, we, we have an autonomy of choice, you know. And so I even was saying it in my own journey. I'm not looking for someone who's going to, like, sweep me off my feet or who's going to, like, take my heart to different places. I'm looking for someone who wants to make that choice. Mm. I'm done with the love stories. I kind of want a life story. Yeah. So make that choice. And let's sit down and work on it. It's therapy we need. Let's do it. It's mm. this is what you need, and this is what I'm, I'm making this choice. Because when you love someone, you make these choices. Mm. You make choices out of that love. You know, we, we, parents do it for their kids any day. You know, I, I'm gonna go and work hard and slave myself mm. so you can get that nice bag to go with to school, so you can get your hair done. You know, out of that love, you make that choice. Mm. So I do believe it is a choice. And for do sure. you believe that there's that there's a spark though to start that? kind of um initial like initial yes, interaction of with course, someone of course. and then you okay. yeah yeah there is that because then that's how you identify the chemistry yeah. right that's how you identify the sojatia the like-mindedness mm. you won't be able to identify it until you have that exchange mm. and then it hits like oh you know wow interesting mm. oh i like how you said that oh you challenged my Intrigue. thinking all right yeah. and then from there then it kind of can penetrate a little bit mm. deeper yeah. yeah so interesting we could talk about love like all week (laughs) call me back (laughs) Um, so just to finish off from everything we've spoken about but from your journey like your spiritual journey what is the last message that you would give to the listeners and the viewers wow yes um the key message key message i remember i I, yeah there's a sutra that i normally say this mantra that um i'm made of love i'm made to give love and to receive love oh divine cause who forever loves me, teach me how to love and engage me in your loving service. Um, and uh, that's a mantra that I recite to myself almost every day. Um, and uh, if everyone who's listening has this internal resolve that I am a being of love, always remind yourself this, you are a being of love. And, um, you know, and you have this opportunity every day to be able to express this nature of you as a loving being with others. Um, be more conscious of it 
Definitely meditation. I'd say meditate. Take that time to yourself. Mantra meditation is a perfect one, but find a meditation that works mm. for you. You know, it's not that it's one, it's like a cookie cutter, like one size fits all. You know, find an intensity that suits your personality to blossom spiritually in your reality. Um, and yeah, and then you can open yourself up to this storehouse of love that's rooted within your heart. And as Beyonce says, we go around in circles searching for love, looking for something that lives inside me. Mm. So you can find it if you purpose for it in that way. That would be my final message. And we ended with Beyonce. And we ended with Beyonce. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm giving you my love. And I'm so glad to know you and I hope we can, you know, take this relationship forward. Of course. Um, yeah. And thank you so much for coming on and your time today. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank Too you. many more.